All right. Welcome back, folks, to Whoop Capital Management's weekly Whoop in Review broadcast series where we talk through happenings in the market on Fridays at the close. Uh, this is Managing Director Rod Alsman. I'll be here joined with a few of my teammates and folks joining the live spaces conversation to talk through this week's newsletter. There's a couple of programming notes that I need to share. We're going to be trying to change up the formatting just a little bit for those of you who participated in the past. Um, if you are interested in following along with my screen share, you can do so by being uh, a Wookiee in the Wook Discord server. There's no cost to do so. Uh, Wook.gg in your URL will bring you straight to the server invite. Um, to get full unfettered access to the server, we simply ask that you introduce yourself. <laughs> Very low barrier to entry. So I do need to make sure everyone is aware that Wook Capital Management Inc. and its employees solely provide investment advisory services to family clients and do not provide investment advisory services to the general public. Furthermore, investments are highly speculative in nature and involve substantial risk of loss. We encourage investors to obtain advice from your professional investment advisor and to make independent investigations before acting on information that we publish. We cannot assure you that the information is accurate or complete. We do not in any way warrant or guarantee the success of any action you take in reliance on our statements or recommendations. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results, and all investment decisions of an individual remain the specific responsibility of that individual. Okay, with that mouthful out of the way, uh, if you're following along my screen, um, uh, and Han, um, have you as co-host. So if you could, while I kind of read through this, just pin the thread Joe put out to the channel so anyone who's not receiving a newsletter can uh, peruse the thread and click through the links as needed. Um, that's great. If not, I can I can do that when, uh, when I get through the intro, this intro here. But yeah, I have up my screen. Again, as I mentioned, I'm sharing my screen. I'm, I'm going to do my best not to really refer to items on the screen. It's, it's just to hopefully make it a little bit better if anyone is at a computer and wants to see visuals as well as audio. Um, but our newsletter that I sent out uh, that we sent out this morning. Um, it goes out every Friday morning around 9 a.m. Eastern. Um, has you know a few different programming items that we're going to talk through. Uh, in the past, if you've participated in these, I've kind of walked all the way from the top through the bottom of the prepared content before opening it up for dialogue. We're going to change that this week and going forward. And as always, we appreciate feedback from anyone on, on ways we can make this more valuable for you. Um, but we're going to go topic by topic, open it up for dialogue um, to, to folks in the audience who'd like to speak on it or ask questions on it, as well as the WOOP team members kind of going back and forth on it. So um, it'll be a little bit different format this week and going forward. So I do, I am kind of going to walk, though, top to bottom to the newsletter in terms of the topics. The, you know, I opened the newsletter up with a visual from Goldman Sachs Prime Desk showing short hedge fund short borrowing and short covering or short selling and short covering. And you can see from that visual that in terms of U.S. information technology, the rate of covering over the last two or so weeks has been over the last decade. We're talking about you know, 99th percentile levels of covering, really 99.8th, I guess, uh, or so with January 21 being the only time that short covering was at a higher rate. So there's a, there's a couple, I think, key moving parts here in this market. Now I open up the newsletter noting that domestic stock indices have largely stalled out after that historic rally to start the year. Um, I, I didn't include it because the story, I think I first saw it when I couldn't fall asleep last night and I was reading in bed <laughs> until early hours, but this was a Yahoo Finance story. Um, they might have came from Bloomberg originally, but the headline is retail investors are pouring a record $1.5 billion per day into the stock market. And Tesla remained the favorite among this group with retail inflows to the stock totaling just shy of $10 billion here to date so far. So this is data from VandaTrack. you are heard that name before. They've monitored some of these meme and retail favorites for at least a year now. Um, and they are often reported uh, reporting on some of these different data points for retail 
uh, flows. So this image that it's not in the newsletter, but I do have it up on my screen. Again, go to whoop.gg and in the voice chat, you can follow along the visuals live. But um, I did tweet the visual on my personal account at Rod Alsman. Um, let me, let me actually, oh, there's Joe. Let me get him added as a co-host. Uh, here am I up to two co-hosts. Okay. I, we'll get him as a speaker then. So, um, basically what it showed is, uh, let me just go into my tweets, um, and, and pin it for, for ease. Uh, so everyone can see it, but basically cumulative retail daily net inflows, the 21 day moving average of those inflows is higher than at any point in the past year. So in addition to that meaningful inflows, and this is single stock inflows. So we're talking about, and there we go. I have it pinned now. Um, so obviously Tesla, NVIDIA with this AI intrigue, um, other you know, meme stocks, uh, and other just big, big name mega cap tech. So the top five were Tesla, the SPY, which is the S&P 500 ETF, Amazon, Apple, and NVIDIA were the top five. And obviously all of those stocks are up pretty meaningfully, including the index year to date. So um, we've got short covering plus retail buying, uh, though the n story notes, and this aligns with really what I've been reading uh, elsewhere, that broadly uh, institutional investors, professional investors are, are pretty neutral still or, or underweight domestic indice, uh, equities, excuse me. So you've got this retail buying, you've got the short covering. Um, could this rally continue if there is reason for institutional investors to chase the rally, to not underperform, that's certainly possible. Um, I, as of course, don't know what's going to happen, but I think it's interesting to note that this uh, ongoing short covering coupled with this retail buying is, is how we've really started the year. It's a very different atmosphere than 2022. And in the context, though, of short-term interest rate and Fed funds futures uh, you know, rising over the last couple of weeks, doesn't, it seems like there's a disconnect between equities and bond markets to an extent. So we'll see how that resolves itself. My inclination is that this is a bear market rally and that it will resolve itself with domestic equities trading down before uh, it's all said and done. But of course, short squeezes are violent and this could continue. So started off with that um, as a talking point. I'll, I'll pause there uh, before we keep going. Joe, Han, and, and anyone in the audience, you know, would, I guess I'll ask, is there any pushback on that? And is there any in incremental comment on that that, that you guys are seeing or, or any other data points you've come across um, in line with that discussion? We'll be shared another chart in the Wook and Review thread, and I will pin that right now to the nest. And let's see. Yeah, the short covering chart. Yeah, that, that one's not pinned yet, so I'm going to pin that as well. Maybe you can uh, – let's see. And then we also have – of course, you said still haven't talked about the resilience and consumer spending, uh, the half-century low employment. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I – Explain to that one. I'll throw that one. I'll topic. throw that one in the nest right now too. Yep. Okay, well, let's let's keep going then. Um, you're right. There's there's more to talk about. So, uh, first off, just programming notes before we get through the balance of the topics to discuss today. We are going to continue our book club series. Obviously, uh, margin of safety was a pretty dense finance read, and we're going to lighten it up a little bit with another book that I think is hopefully valuable. It should be valuable for you, whether you're a beginner, novice, or or expert investor. Um, Morgan Housel's Psycho The Psychology of Money. It's really uh, an easy to read book. It's a pretty short read. Um, it's, it's him really combining 19 little short stories, exploring the ways that people think about money. And it, the focus is on improving the way that you think about money. And it's, it's a lot less uh, 
you know, finance detail, you know, the type of stuff that you might need a glossary if you're not that well read on the matter. Um, it's 256 pages. So we're going to do that as we'll continue to do the last Tuesday night of every month this year. Um, we have the full book list to come in short order so that if you're interested in getting ahead on any of those reads, you are welcome to. That's going to come in the next week or two. But for February 28th, so you know, 11 days from now, we'll be doing that at 8 p.m. Eastern on Spaces, um, talking about the psychology of money. I, I reread it on uh, my flight to Vegas, ironically enough. And yeah, it's, it's a really excellent read. I think there's a lot of great takeaways. So I hope that folks will join us um, when we have that conversation at the end of the month. Um, okay, so in addition to the topic we'll kind of circle back on, um, next topic is on this uh, Biden administration opening up or trying to get the electric car charging networks opened up to um, all really EVs so that they're not as uh, limited, right? The Tesla supercharging network, of course, has been the at the forefront in terms of having broad network coverage, some of the highest charging rates, and that until now, or until 2024, when this comes into being, uh, has been limited to Tesla vehicles in North America. So there's federal funding, as long as certain criteria are met, that Tesla GM, Ford, ChargePoint, other network operators will be able to receive by keep you know having their networks open for all, um, to not get overly technical, the combined charging standard, the CCS, is kind of the primary charging standard in North America. Um, Tesla will have to ensure that superchargers are, are readily uh, usable for vehicles that are not using the Tesla um, charging standard, are using the CCS. So you know, it's in line with this Biden administration goal of at least half a million EV chargers by 2030. So that news came out earlier in the week, you know, it's, it's interesting to me because for a long time, Tesla's supercharging network has been, at least I've understood it to be viewed by the bulls as a competitive advantage. Uh, the fact that you really, they were the only um, OEM that one could buy to easily access a charging network that would allow you to do road, road trips broadly nationwide. So opening this up, while clearly Tesla will receive some benefits directly from the federal government and indirectly in the pursuit of their mission to push sustainable uh, transportation forward, um, you know, it makes me question, is that now no longer a competitive advantage of Tesla's if the network, the charging network is usable by, by any and all EV um, vehicles. So, so, so I put that headline in there, you know, Joe, I know you had a road trip experience with a model three in California recently. Obviously people have heard me talk about my experience with EVs, but I guess the question, you know, I put in the newsletter is how will this impact your thinking about buying an EV? And I included a link to uh, plug in America's survey from last year. They'll likely it came out in February of 2022. So I imagine their revised survey will come out shortly. But basically, the question uh, you know, around what are the primary like reasons why or, or enablers for EV adoption are to have better charging at home. And uh, yeah, so I guess I'll pause there. And yeah, I mean, I'll Joe, explain my uh, Model 3 road trip experience. So I went on a road trip from San Diego up to a Lake Tahoe for a skiing trip. And my buddy had a Tesla model three dual motor. So it was going to be, you know, decent in the snow, but we took that up there and it was supposed to be, you know, typically that's about an, I want to say a nine and a half hour drive. And with the stop, with the supercharging stops it ended up being more like 12 hours. So it did add a, quite a bit of time onto the trip. And, um, the, the total charging cost was about, I want to say, um, comparable to like what a, a modern day Prius would cost to fill up. So not superb, not, not like amazing, but obviously it's much cheaper to charge it when you're at home. So that's kind of what 
I, I see the Teslas as most useful. I think the road trip experience, we ended up spending just as much money as we would if we had a gasoline car because every time we stopped, we had to stop, you know, every hour and a half or so to charge. Um, every time we stopped, we ended up, you know, you're stopping at a Panera Bread or a, a, a shopping mall. Like those are where the charging stations are at. And when you're there, you know, you're bored for like 30 minutes. So you might as well go spend some money. So <laughs> even though, you know, it's a weird way to think of it, but like naturally I spent just as much money as I would taking a gasoline car because every time i stop you know i have 30 minutes to kill and i'm not just gonna sit around and like go on my phone so i might as well buy some stuff or eat some lunch or whatever so it was uh interesting i will say the experience of like pulling up and just plugging in the charger and walking away it already knows your credit card it already knows you know how much to charge it like it's very sophisticated i would say that that is like a, a very it felt futuristic it did it felt really good but just the waiting um, got old, and I would say it would be a great car as a daily commuter, but I would not prefer it for a, for a road trip like that. And that's probably fine because I don't think most people are looking to road trip in their Teslas. They're just looking to get around town. And the, the obviously the charging network is a big pull, and that was like well, something. He, this gentleman also has an e-tron that I went up with, and the e-tron, he says you could never do a road trip like that. It's just the charging is not reliable outside of Tesla's network. That's good, good detail. So I, I think your, your point that's important to drive home is that the operational cost savings was not really there when it comes to using the superchargers relative to the cost of liquid fuel, even in California, which of course has its own high cost of liquid fueling due to the state policy policies. Um, and then the time, right? You noted that it took you several more hours than it would have if it were, you know, a, a straight shot with, you know, the five or so minutes it takes to liquid fuel a vehicle versus, um, you know, even with a high speed supercharger, get that uh, those electrons into the battery pack. So it's it's interesting. It still seems like for for the time being, you're sacrificing as a consumer on those long road trips in terms of you're not really saving so much operational cost uh, in terms of fuel and, and you're obviously forsaking some time, but, but I mean, you're right. And as, as somebody who's owned a, a plug-in hybrid for most of the last decade, it's, it's absolutely, and the plug share, or excuse me, the plug in America survey that I had included in the report kind of aligns with this, that quote, the most important economic factor responded and cited was access to inexpensive home charging. And that was even more important than the federal EV tax credit. And uh, I, I can say from, personal experience before we either you know move on or welcome any more comment on the matter that I, when I lived in a, uh, a single family home, when I currently live in, um, that's great. I can plug in to a regular wall outlet. You don't even need to make infrastructure investments because a level one, you know, just a basic plug will satisfy your charging needs as a, you know, for a plug-in hybrid. But when I, I had moved to an apartment in Miami that did not have charging and, um, I only owned one vehicle. So as a Chevy Volt owner, it was fine. I was able to run the generator motor and and not plug in. But if I had owned a Tesla, it would have added some significant inconvenience to my life where I would have had to get a new vehicle. So for now, I think these networks are still underpenetrated. Like if you you are a homeowner or you live maybe in a state or um, multifamily housing situation where that, that infrastructure is there, great. Uh, but but the survey respondents clearly show that's the primary uh, constraint for people to buy is to have access to home inexpensive home charging, and it, these these over the road networks are are great to have, um, but it doesn't seem like that's a primary contributor to buying for for now. So we'll be interested to see as twenty four comes along and you know, people are able to tap into these networks. You know, how does that affect adoption, if at all? But obviously it aligns with the federal government's ongoing, uh, the current administration's ongoing hopes to drive adoption of electric vehicles. Han, any thoughts? So I was thinking um, if if we're going to have all these, you know, um, charging stations along the road, then, you know, um, what what is it what is it uh, what does it mean for for the market? What kind of uh, opportunities does it create? So. Um, just an idea that that I had, but but I think you know we'll see more and more companies kind of entering this space, um, trying to target people who are charging and waiting, 
Um, so, for example, you know, when, when Joe uh, pulled up to Panera, um, you know, plug in his car and wait for 30 minutes, you know, that could be a good opportunity for Panera to send some coupons or any kind of other businesses around to target these people and try to make more, um, you know, make more opportunities to, to, to make money. And, and maybe that will be a trend that we see as we see these um, charging stations expand across the country. And I, I just a cool pinned, thing. yeah, for sure. And I just pinned because the story came out uh, last night after hours um, in line with this discussion that uh, BP, the oil major, is buying TA, Travel Centers of America, for $1.3 billion. So TA, if you've ever gone on a long road trip, is one of, you know, like Pilot Flying J, you know, one of those big um, interstate uh, fueling slash refreshment locations. So the fact that BP is buying one, I think is kind of interesting. Uh, the Reuters reporting notes, you know, the British energy giant seeks to expand its retail network in a bet on biofuels and electric vehicle charging. Uh, TA owns a network of 281 highway sites across 44 states. So it, it offers services like truck maintenance, restaurants, travel stores, and parking, which are 70% of the profit margin. Remember, you know, the, most of these gasoline and liquid fuel retailers profit margin is not coming from the fuel itself. It's coming from all the accoutrement that comes along with a, a stop to refuel. So that, that I think just is interesting. Um, you'll continue to see, and, and you know, for BP, I think this play involves a variety of fuels, not just electrification, but uh, this quote, the services complement BP's existing convenience and mobility business and will help in expanding its offers, including electric vehicle charging, biofuels, renewable natural gas, and later hydrogen, the company said. So it's a little bit of a, you know, get the land, get the locations. You've already got the infrastructure built um, that they don't have to start from zero. They paid a hefty premium. It was over 80, uh, it was an 80 something percent premium to the closing price the prior day. But uh, yeah, ongoing investment in this space. Right. Um, that That's pretty shocking to me that, you know, I mean, obviously BP is a huge company and, and I'm sure they're dying to kind of enter into the space and be the first mover in, um, you know, getting all the data for all these people trying to charge and trying to sell um, other products to them. But 84% premium for TA, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot, you know, obviously for any company. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to see kind of these big, you know, traditional energy players enter into the market and try to disrupt, you know, how we charge our, our EVs, you know, especially as we see all these charging networks expand, you know, we'll, we'll see a lot of um, traditional energy players trying to capitalize um, in this, uh, you know, new opportunity that that's going to be created. Exciting stuff. Yeah, I'm sure the deal had been in the works before the Biden administration's announcement of the $7.5 billion in federal funds for this national charging network. But, uh, you know, a few billion helps. So, all right. <laughs> we'll keep going. And, and again, if anyone wants to come up and speak on the topic at hand, we're going to, as, as I mentioned at the onset, change the format a little bit. We're going to go topic by topic and have the discussion rather than me uh, preaching through the entire newsletter and then uh, circling back. So don't, don't hesitate if you have a question or comment on a previous topic to bring it up along the way. Um, but that was our kind of conversation on, on the charging network. Uh, with you know Tesla opening theirs up and, and obviously uh, the federal move and then BP. So next topic is on one of my favorites. For those of you who follow my personal account, you know I love me some Allison Transmission. So I did host an impromptu spaces call uh, Wednesday after the close. It was really just me and Chris R. who I see listening in. Um, I have that link in the newsletter and you're welcome to, to catch the recap. I tried to share some insights on the business as I understand it. Um, they reported great results. Um, I included a couple threads that I had been talking about uh, on the matter. I, I was invited to participate with the Chit Chat Money guys a week or so ago. Um, so that podcast link is also included if you want to hear a longer discussion on Allison. But you know, I, I, I guess to try to draw it into what why I would include it, uh, you know, they guided for record revenue and earnings for 2023. And you might have heard me mention this in some other venues that the truck makers, you think about your, your Packars, PCAR, um, your Daimler trucks, which is now its own entity, 
your uh, Trayton, which is Volkswagen trucks business, you know, all these OEMs had issues for the preceding few years where they couldn't get the necessary semiconductors, you know, the, the really, just like automakers, they couldn't get the really you know, basic chips that when orders were canceled at the beginning of COVID by many kind of sent them to the back of the line and chip makers prioritized higher margin, more advanced chips as well as there being issues with things like wiring harnesses and, um, and, and just the windshields, you know, with the, some issues in the Gulf Coast from, from a chemicals perspective. So there's a lot of backlog in trucking. Uh, the truck fleet, according to PACAR, you know, it's 10 to 15% older than it otherwise would have been, ex-COVID disruption. So you think about industries that had a lot of demand pulled forward, you know, it's almost the opposite for... Uh, for truck manufacturers, they, they had a lot of demand. Yes, they, they had a lot of orders, but they weren't able to build them all. So they have a pretty hefty backlog. And these businesses have done quite well uh, with, with the, what's obviously become a spot freight recession now over the last 11-ish months. Um, but preceding that, you know, these companies make a lot of money. And, and how do they reinvest in their business? They buy new equipment and they take advantage of the tax uh, regulations there. So, so there, there's a lot of new trucks to be built specific to Allison, and this might get a little bit in the weeds, but you know, truck makers prioritized manufacturing sleeper tractors. You know, your, your big rig that the trucker sleeps in um, and drives freight, you know, long haul over the road uh, across the country. So those are higher margin for the truck OEMs. They prioritized, you know, given the supply constraints, they prioritized manufacture of those. So for someone like Allison, who isn't participating in the sleeper market, but has an outsized proportion of the straight truck market, the vocational truck market, you know, your emergency vehicles, your construction equipment, your, your cement mixers, um, all, all sorts of local uh, distribution vehicles, especially think your you know, 26 foot box truck, you know, your class six box truck um, and, and some of the class seven equipment, they have a you know, close to 80% market share in those. And those were under built by OEMs in COVID era. So they have a pretty strong uh, view toward manufacturing for 23. And then 24, you know, it remains to be seen just how much of a give back there is. Uh, but either way, um, you know, the, the stock made all time highs after earnings on Thursday, it made all time highs if you uh, adjust the dividends out. So, you know, one of those boring industrial businesses that, uh, you know, underperformed for several years, because of multiple compression, um, you can hear more details on it, of course, if you want to check out the interview. But yeah, with those favorable, the other thing, and I know Monitive Wealth, I see listening, and we've talked about defense a little bit, is the real favorable outlook for defense. So Allison spent a lot of the Q, or the prepared remarks, uh, there was a very short Q&A, it was only three questions, but the prepared remarks, they really noted how much uh, of a boost they expect to see from both their existing customer base, which remember, almost every single truck and uh, you know, tracked or wheeled vehicle the United States Army deploys is propelled by an Allison transmission. The Abrams tank is propelled by an Allison transmission. Uh, as these are consumed in warfare, of course, um, you've got more replacement vehicles that need to be produced and built, as well as, as more allied nations up their defense spending, uh, Allison will benefit from that tail end on the defense side. So you know, just from a company forecast perspective, you know, they have an 8% uh, sales growth for defense at the midpoint. You know, it's only 5% of sales. So we're not talking about an outsized contributor to the company's um, you know, underlying business, but it is, is one of those nice little perks as defense is hot and should continue to be hot uh, they they talked about their new products you know, being well received, and they've got some interesting you know uh, hybrid type products that are going to come into market over over the next several years as this decade rolls along. And uh, yeah, it's just uh, you don't appreciate, I guess, some, sometimes when a business has a, maybe a minority segment, but but uh, it's always nice when you get some tailwinds there. Um, so yeah, any questions, comments on Allison, Joe, and Han? Or folks in the audience? Rod, I just want to see that video of you going around and pointing out all the Allison transmission trucks because that's what it was like in Vegas. We walked down the strip, Rod, and anytime you noticed a truck would have an Allison transmission, you had to point it out to me. 
<laughs> yeah, I miss uh, seeing Raw just kind of jump out of his seat every time uh, there's an Allison transmission. Um, but but uh, I was really surprised because, um, you know, obviously I'm, I'm not an expert in, in the trucking field, but just the just the you know level of penetration like level of um just like application allison is everywhere um which i haven't noticed before but thanks to rod um you know it's uh it's just crazy to kind of think about these players um that are not visible to the eye but such a crucial part of uh, infrastructure yeah before we move on from it um in, in line with what you just said I'll, they put their 10k out yesterday so uh let me go to the market share and just kind of share a couple factoids so so you know, Allison Transmission, again, this is formerly uh, General Motors owned. They sold it to private equity in 07. It came public in 2012. So this is the medium and heavy duty uh, automatic transmission business. And you know, really, if you think about school bus, for example, in North America, which is their core market, 85% of the new, new school buses built have an Allison Transmission. 79% of class six through eight trucks have an Allison transmission. I mean, they, they are far and away the market share leader in some of their core markets. And no, the reason is that there is not really a compelling competitive product. While there is, there are a couple other automatic transmission manufacturers, ZF, Friedrichshaven out of Germany, um, Voith competes with them in Europe on like the bus side. And then of course, like Cat, um, Caterpillar, you know, does compete with them in mining with its, you know, integrated, uh, fully integrated uh, approach. But like, there's not really a true other automatic transmission maker who doesn't have a variety of other businesses. So in their core markets, uh, I see that as a very high barrier to entry, that it's unlikely you'll see a new transmission player enter the market, given the reality that many of these vehicles over time are expected to transition toward electrified or other um, fuel sources. But the great thing is the transmission works. If it's an internal combustion uh, diesel engine, if it's a natural gas engine, renewable natural gas, hydrogen, which Cummins has talked about hydrogen internal combustion. Now, there's, of course, the uncertainty around electrification adoption in, in the heavy duty and medium duty space. But um, you know, they have some growth opportunities. So the class eight day caps, you think like you know, a U.S. foods uh, tractor that, you know, is going to go replenish your uh, your local restaurants that you love to go to. You know, that, that sort of duty cycle where it's a lot of, you know, stop and go, it's in the middle of the city or it's kind of a high density, you know, that transmission shines in that sort of an application uh, and, and it delivers a compelling value prop to the end user. And that's why they, they have the market share they do because it's, it's just a better product than the, the alternative, which would be, you know, a manual transmission or an automated manual transmission. So yeah, it's like one of those things that, again, you don't think about when you walk by a truck, but it's, it's a integral component. It, it will often be like a mid single digit portion of the final sale price um, or maybe more depending on the application. Um, but yeah, you know, it's one of those little businesses that that's, Keeps turning along, keeps generating nice profit, has a, an attractive, you know, double digit free cash, low double digit free cash flow yield to the firm. Granted, they have some leverage, but uh, yeah. And Monica, I know you came up to speak. I, I don't know if you'd like to add any comments uh, in, in or on the defense side or, or Allison side. Yeah, I, I sent uh, the Rod account a link to, uh, you know, an article on, uh, on bullishness in the truck sector over the next few years. So the semi-truck side, so I think that bodes very well for Allison. And on the defense side, uh, they did get picked up for uh, the CTT, the common tactical truck uh, prototype. So that's a good sign. So that prototype is actually moving along pretty fast. So, so once they start building that, you know, the next generation trucks, plus remember we are emptying out inventory of a lot of old equipment and giving it to, to – uh, uh, Ukraine, so there's going to be a lot of replacement business from from uh, you know from defense. DoD is 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 uh, literally emptying their shelf. So most people don't understand. You know, we're not giving Ukraine any money. What we are doing is we are giving them you know non uh, restricted, not current technology gear, so they can you know which which still. You know, matches of decades ahead. I was about to say, it still matches pretty well with the uh, old Soviet equipment. <laughs> decades ahead. Two decades ahead. But but the point I'm trying to make is 
it 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 kicks off a replacement cycle. Yeah. This is not part of the defense budget. It's a separate line item that DOD is tracking. So that will have to be given as a separate budget from 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 the uh, 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 from from uh, you know from Congress. So all of these bode very well for equipment suppliers. So so just saying that you know both on the commercial and defense side. I think Allison, I, I, and I always like the, you know, the the supplier play in, in most of these uh, heavy industries. People don't realize, you know, the the uh, aggregator, the the assembler, doesn't make right. most of the money through life cycle. It is the part supplier services that make more money. That's a that's a really good point. The the person who, you know, as, as similar in the automotive side, right? The, the car maker who just assembles everything, um, you know, their margins are, other than Tesla, pretty thin. And the suppliers, you know, a lot of the suppliers have traded at pretty depressed multiples for several years now because of the overhang of electrification. But I think, I think that the, with Allison in particular, it's, uh, you know, it's a view that I have that that penetration will be slow and over time and they'll continue to reap really attractive margins. I mean, their EBITDA margin is, is in the mid thirties for, for somebody who's really just assembling steel and uh, aluminum components into a transmission, which is incredible if you think about it. And, and it should continue. Um, as I noted on the you know, competition side, it's unlikely that legacy uh, competitors are going to invest meaningfully in quote unquote legacy tech. But <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah, the other the other thing most people don't yet talk about, but it might be interesting down the road is is EU is is still trying to you know phase out uh, uh, you know nice. uh, ICEs yeah. in the next twenty years or so. So I have to believe that uh, European manufacturers of components will thin down their you know their competitive uh, you know uh, investment in in older stuff, which is a positive for. For, uh, for somebody like Allison who's not facing that. That's right. And um, you, you mentioned the the one new application that they're in. And I, for anyone who's following the screen, I pulled up the eGen Force product, which will go into that new uh, infantry fighting vehicle, or if they win. Uh, and then, of course, future main battle tank. So, you know, they, they're pretty well positioned. I think, as Monica noted, there's a pretty nice, unexpected. Well, you know, sad for the human cost, obviously, in Ukraine, but th that this equipment has to get replenished uh, across allied nations. So that should be a tailwind for players like Allison and, and Defense. Um, very good. Any other thoughts? Uh, anyone else want to chime in uh, on the speaker panel or come up from the audience and talk about you know, Defense or, or Allison or before we continue on? Okay, seeing no hands, and we can circle back to it at the end if we if anyone wants to. But I'll continue on to the next topic. So, um, next topic was pulling up some of the data. I mean, clearly, the the single sentence is the American consumer remains resilient, and that's happened for a couple of months now. That the consumer is clearly in a stronger position than the most. Uh, I guess bearish prognostications across 2022 had led, maybe would have led one to believe. Um, we had the January retail sales come in very strong. I have that on the screen um, and I have it in the newsletter showing meaningful 3% month over month uh, move on this retail sales side. Really everything was positive. Even gas stations was, was, were flat. And a couple other sectors were flat, but uh, or components were flat, but really strong performance in motor vehicle sales. And that, you know, it kind of beggars the question if, if used vehicle and new vehicle prices are resurging again, that disinflation that has been happening on the good side in, you know, different components of that goods, um, how long can that go on for if now you're seeing prices rise again for new and, and existing equipment uh, or vehicles, excuse me, um, strong demand for, for, food service and drinking places. So that's, it was a good graphic. I don't have it handy. Um, that showed like it was a, from John authors and his points of return newsletter. They showed the 
Delta, one line was eating out and the other line was eating at home. And you can really see a widening of that as people, you know, look, I get it. We all are, I think, still um, tapping into that uh, desire to, to travel and go and see the world and do these things that we weren't able to do for a period of time, you know, in 2020 and 21. So I, I question how durable and how long that can go on for in the context of other data points coming in from uh, the Federal Reserve, for example, showing that consumer credit card balances made a new all-time high, um, you know, just shy of a trillion dollars from Fed data that came out on Thursday. So you know, everyone, I think, has probably heard this repeatedly, that there's all this excess consumer savings that they're still working through and eventually will get fully worked through. Um, this spending is being funded in part by increased borrowing in addition to the the excess savings. So at some point later this year, those excess savings will be fully consumed. And that's where the question mark, I think, becomes how, how strong will the mar will the consumer remain um, maybe when those have gotten consumed in full. So I, I pulled the data, just a couple data points from from the New York Fed, mortgage debt rose by about a quarter trillion, quarter over quarter. At an annual rate, it rose by about a trillion. Now that's in the context of a roughly 12 trillion in outstanding mortgage debt. So you know, a high single digit rate of change from an annual basis, that's pretty significant debt uh, uh, leveraging up. Um, on the student loan debt side, and that's another consideration, right? We've got this ongoing, um, these continued delays. Now we have the litigation going on with the Biden administration's hopes of um, waiving some of the debt. So that, as I understand it, will be resolved at some point this year uh, by, I think it's 60 days after the June 30th. I don't know. Who knows the exact date? At some point, likely in the third quarter, possibly fourth quarter, those debt repayments will begin again. The deferrals that have been on since COVID began will, will cease. So you have a lot of, it comes out to about 60 billion in annual spend. So you know, it's not immaterial. It's, it's not you know, a massive swathe of the economy, but 60 billion that presumably a large chunk of that has been getting consumed as opposed to saved to be um, paid down on student loans. So that's something to look out for on the debt side. And then the, you know, the credit card debt, right? It's just shy of a trillion now. It rose 60 billion over the fourth quarter. So um, that's a pretty steep rate of change. And as folks will point out, uh, delinquency rates remain below historical levels. They are still muted. And, and the point I made in the newsletter is really that, oh, Joseph, that's perfect. I appreciate you pinning that. That's exactly yeah, what no I was problem. referring to. Yeah, I saw Cantor put that out this morning. Well, true phrase is it. Cantor retweeted it this morning. And you have my bullet points you're talking about right now. Go ahead. Yep. So, so yeah, it's uh, look, that, that image that Joseph put out is exactly what I was referring to. If you look at the pin tweets, that, that um, you know, the consumer's savings rate remains near all-time low levels. And as the consumer continues to eat through the excess, excess savings accumulated, Right. Eventually, we get to a point, and I think the concern is again the rate of change. So that excess savings is rapidly being depleted. These consumer borrowings are rapidly rising. Delinquencies are rising. Those are all the delinquencies are at low levels. But I think the concern that folks have is these rates of change and and what happens next. Right. We're still seeing the economy fully digest this rapid monetary policy tightening, and. Uh, look, who, who knows what's going to happen, but I think these are just some of the things to be aware of, talk about. Um, just let me see if I had any other comments before I kind of open it up to the panel. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the last sentence, I think, really is it. For as long as the labor market remains exceptionally strong, debt repayment shouldn't become a problem. The question is, right, we have the Fed who, even in their summary of economic projections, which will, of course, be updated by this next meeting in March, um, in December, they they'd said you know, that they expect in their base case, 800,000 more Americans unemployed by the end of the year. Clearly, the data point from Jen, you know, showing how strong this labor market appears to be, this continued mismatch of job openings versus folks seeking work 
all of that kind of overhanging the strong underlying labor uh, you know, wage, right? Wages rising disproportionate with stable prices. And that's what the that's the reason why the Fed is trying to slow the economy down on the demand side. So if you see the labor market and we see these headlines, right? And we've talked about this, I think, in other venues that you know, technology layoffs. Well, sure, there have been layoffs, but from very elevated employment levels that are still above pre-COVID levels. And the labor market for blue collar work, construction, um, accommodation, those that remains very strong. So as the year progresses, you know, these are things to keep monitoring uh, and see if the consumer can keep churning along because it is the primary driver of the American economy. So monitor, please chime in. So, so just a couple of points. Uh, you know, I'm 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 neither bullish nor bearish. I'm I'm more realistic about where the market's going and what what to play based on where the you know where we are headed. But on the consumer side, I've, I've been following banks for a long time now, and the the one thing to remember is is we're just trending back to a longer term trend, right? We're yep. we're just falling back out of you know two years of extremely low write-offs, extremely low, you know, extremely high savings, things like that. So so we're just falling back into a longer term trend. I think while while that is not a good trend, right? It's not a sustainable trend, it is still what was there before the pandemic. It's not anything, you know, that that's so scary bad as 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 headlines, you know, make them seem. But it is not a good sign, right? That we are becoming more and more indebted, certainly. But also, uh, in in general terms, the 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 appetite for indebtedness increases with with the you know the strength of employment, right? If you if you trend back, if you look at you know periods where you know uh, where where economy has fallen off. The you know the uh, you know taking on new debt first increases and then starts decreasing very fast. So I'm you know you, you got to take all these things in context. I think it could become a problem, but we're not there. That's all I'm saying. I'm not I saying agree. it's not a yeah. problem. I'm just saying, that's a good take, yeah. right? The rate of change is undesirable. It's still returning toward normal historical levels, but but will it continue and push through that? Right, and we'll have to monitor. Jiro, G- 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 um, please go ahead. Nick, cool. Uh, I actually just wanted to say that, um, I mean, the consumer is definitely weakening, right? And, um, and also the economy will also slow, slow down. But I think um, the only topic that matters is inflation, yeah? And we all know that it will come down one day. But, but the problem is that we all think that it will mean revert towards 2%. Or oh, that's the hope, yeah? <clears throat> Uh, first of all, I think that we will not get to 2% this year, of course not, and, uh, and, and it will be very, very sticky, and, and, and maybe the new average or the new mean is somewhere around 4%, but the Fed will still not cut or, or, or it will start pivoting. So even if the consumer will uh, will 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 weaken further, or if unemployment increases now? Let uh, I think last print was three point four percent. If it increases towards five percent, it doesn't matter. If it doesn't go towards two percent, at least three percent, they will not stop cutting. So I believe, as investors, we also need to have in mind that the only topic that really matters is inflation, and not and not necessarily GDP growth, because Jerome Powell already said that the, the number one issue is inflation and not GDP declining. GDP will decline. Is it uh, in Q2 or in Q3? It will decline, and a couple of uh, quarters of negative GDP will not stop the Fed to... Uh, I mean, it will maybe stop the Fed from hiking. It seems like we are close to the peak in the hiking cycle, but it will not make the Fed pivot the fed will start pivoting when uh when it sees inflation coming down towards two percent another problem that i see with inflation is that the supply chain effect that many people were talking about it seems like that that effect is is actually coming towards an end and also when you look at the freight rates 
they are uh, at or even below pre pre two thousand nineteen uh, uh, le level actually, right? So, so I think uh, the market is very optimistic, but I believe that uh, this year could still be a very very tough year. So before Joseph, who has his hand up, goes, I, I think you're right that for for a, for a long time now, inflation has been the overwhelming priority of the Fed. And I'm sure most people listening have heard the Fed kind of have heard Powell slice it into three primary categories. And you know, the goods disinflation that he talked about, the market really got got really horny about, um, you know, that core services area is the is the last uh last domino that needs to fall for them and clearly at some point in 23 the focus i think will shift away from inflation and toward the the actual underlying economy more than this this inflation boogeyman but i, I would generally agree with your comment joe that it's not likely to return to two percent um it, with this immaculate disinflation uh rapidly and and you've heard fed speakers kind of talk about that they they are at least outwardly saying that they are not going to be raising their target from 2% to 25 or to 3 um, and how much of that is messaging because the reality is it's going to be difficult to get back to that too, I think. But um, Joseph, please chime in. Hey, sure. Thank you very much. Um, I'm kind of a little bit of a different mindset, Gero. Um, although inflation was the big red flag we saw come up um, last spring, and we could see it rising, and we saw what like what the hell's going on. And we know the Federal Reserve has certain abilities through its mechanisms that can it can take. Um, I'm looking at a lot of other things, which are, from my perspective, um, very important to look at. And it's not to say that inflation isn't, but inflation has a lot of components embedded into it. You know, when you're looking at all the different aspects of what's feeding into a CPI number, um, there are a lot of different things you have to do to try and manage that. What I'm looking at and has me looking at the stress we're looking at maybe in 2023 is a couple of things. And as we were talking about earlier in regards to savings, savings have gone down and you can't have zero savings. That would not be a good thing necessarily. Um but it's gone down significantly and that's not great necessarily. We have data out there showing that credit card debt is way up. There's data out there showing that delinquencies are up. I was going to try and find you the data to, to support the idea that um, the reserves are up for banks, but I know it's been out there and people, me, I know I've seen that. There's some data that came out recently like last day. I was trying to find the backup of that bankruptcies 50 million plus have spiked. Um, and we know that basically large corporations are starting to default in some regards to large positions on real estate. Um, and so what I'm looking at is kind of a more broad aspect of all the different inputs of the general economy. You know, I tend to always look at on a daily basis, like things like, say, for example, layoffs. And I keep my eye really closely on unemployment. Um, so although I know there's a lot of conversations going around about the Federal Reserves and Powell, I kind of look at them more basically as catalysts and how people react in the market um, more than anything else. I mean, they can only really do so much at this point. You know, they've raised interest rates and they can't go much more before they destroy the country. Because you can't afford to bring it much higher, otherwise you can't afford to pay the interest on the debt, and that's just and that's just a horrible thing we're looking at right now. So they're kind of they're kind of stuck, and although they can basically you know do the T bills and have those go into the market, they can't really kind of clear the books of basically MBAs, you know, of basically mortgages, because there's not really a strong market right now for mortgages. So when I like what's going on. I'm looking at basically the different inputs and I still see the potential strong aspect of a recession at this point um, as a possibility. Thanks, Wook. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Joseph. Yeah, I think it gets back to A, we don't know what's going to happen, but B, trying to suss out what is priced in and with how domestic equities have moved over the last 
couple months, like, and I've you know, I've seen this take from from a lot of smarter people than myself, but the perspective being that soft landing is is clearly vastly priced into equity prices, and now there's you know I included in the newsletter the idea of no landing that things do not slow down, um, and that obviously pushes the issue out of what what has to happen to slow things down enough if inflation if the disinflation that's being seen in goods reverts back you know noted car prices right are starting to rise again well if that continues then your goods disinflation across various categories eventually tapers off it laps itself and perhaps it begins to rise again so you know it it definitely is still uh, up in the air i think a lot of people have been calling for bad things for a long time and have been wrong eventually bad things may in fact happen uh, but definitely need to stay nimble uh, and I think accept willingness to adjust your viewpoint as, as new data come in. Um, I want to I want to get to the last topic, too, because we can certainly keep talking about um, you know the state of the consumer. But it, unless anyone had any additional comments on the consumer that they're seeing that maybe we haven't touched on, I, I'd love to hear it before we move on to a little bit of a governance uh, peculiarity discussion. Okay, so last topic that I had in the prepared content was, um, for one, Matt Levin. If you don't follow Matt Levin and you don't read his uh, his money stuff, he has some really just excellent, he's an excellent writer. He, he makes it very approachable. And I think he always uncovers and, and opines on some very interesting matters. So I had linked three of his recent uh, stories um, this one was from earlier in the month talking about AMC and Ape. There was one from earlier this week around Purple, the mattress company, and then one from yesterday around another uh, company named Solagenics. So before I go into any of the examples, it, the broader theme is as retail shareholders have become the predominant owners of several companies, whether they're a meme like AMC or, or just some small cap biotech like this Sologenics or like DWAC, right? Where DWAC had issues getting shareholder approval to, to vote. It all kind of boils down to the fact that generally retail shareholders don't exercise their, uh, their rights as, as voters when it comes to proxies and uh, the like. So the AMC one, is interesting. I'll try to summarize it. Um, AMC issued these preferred, uh, I think they called them preferred equity units. Yeah. Ape is the token. So they were capped on how many shares by their charter they could issue. And they needed to get a majority approval from all shares to allow them to amend the, ch the corporate charter. Now, if most of your shareholders are retail shareholders who do not vote and you need a majority, that presents a conundrum. And so what AMC has done, and in these other examples, I'm not gonna rehash them all. I think they're very interesting to read about and think about so what are the longer term implications, but what AMC did is uh, it issued these pr preferred stock equity units that are very much, you know, they're technically preferred stock, not common stock, but they had the same voting rights as common stock. They had, uh, they were effectively common stock, I think, for all intents and purposes, but not. Um, they can automatically convert into common stock uh, once AMC gets shareholder approval to issue enough stock to cover all of them. So what AMC did was structure the preferred stock voting rights such that uh, if you didn't vote your ape, the ape shares would automatically be voted in line with how the balance of the ape population has voted. So you have a couple of hedge funds that have acquired meaningful stakes in the preferred equity unit ape and Tara Capital uh, got about a quarter billion of them, uh, which is about a third of the apes outstanding. And, you know, that hedge fund, right, they're a, a sophisticated actor. They are going to vote, unlike perhaps the the unsophisticated or less sophisticated um, retail holder of the ape or AMC shares. 
So they structured it so that uh, the apes get to vote along with the common stock. AMC, st AMC still needs a majority of all the combined votes, which is the apes plus the common stock. However, there's a lot more apes than there are common stock because AMC can keep selling those ape preferred equity units, whereas they cannot sell more common stock due to that charter constraint. So they made an adjustment or they, they made a, um, an interesting language in their deposit agreement co governing the ape quote, in the absence of specific instructions from holders of receipts, the depository will vote the preferred stock represented by the AMC preferred equity units evidenced by the receipts of such holders proportionately with votes cast pursuant to instructions received from the other holders. So in less jargony speak, if Antara and the other ape holders vote yes, and people don't vote at all, whatever the proportion of the actual votes are is what the non-votes of the preferred equity units will become. So since there are a hell of a lot more apes outstanding than the common stock, uh, it, it does look like it will be good enough to get this amendment to pass. There's been some discussion about the potential arbitrage opportunity. I'm not gonna go into those details. I think it's interesting between ape and AMC, but that's just, again, an interesting uh, outcome by these, these you know, these silly constraints that your charter prevents you from selling more common stock, um, even though um, you know, seemingly that's the best path forward to keep equity afloat uh, with AMC's heavy debt burden. So the purple situation, I'll, I'll try to be a little more succinct it with, was, was also really interesting. Um, you have this, uh, this idea or this, this thing where sometimes um, based on how a company's uh, charter is structured, there can be cumulative voting when you are involved in a proxy fight. So if there's cumulative voting, you know, for example, there's seven board seats, therefore you get seven votes per share. Instead of having to vote one apiece for the seven board seats, you can vote all seven for one candidate. So with cumulative voting, right, then that would help a minority shareholder because they'd have a better chance of all in on their one particular um, shareholder, or sorry, one particular uh, nominee or, or, or another. So cumulative voting would be good for activists. In Purple's case, you have a large minority shareholder, uh, Coliseum, who owns about 45% of the stock. They had made a take private offer to take the company private uh, in the fourth quarter. It did not succeed. The board of a special committee of Purple's board of directors declined the offer. Now remember, you have Coliseum owns forty five percent of the company. Just because they're almost a majority owner, though, you have a fiduciary responsibility on behalf of the board of directors to to seek to maximize the shareholder value. So they declined the offer, and then on Monday of this week, this forty five percent owner nominated five candidates to Purple's seven-member board of directors, uh, one of whom is already on the board. So, right, math being math, they, uh, they own 45% of the shares outstanding. They should be able to force through their five nominees, which once they have a majority of the board, they effectively control the board. They can effectively uh, allow the board to vote yes, potentially, if, if they were um, to pursue another take private offer. They they note in their press release that they're no longer pursuing their September 22 proposal to acquire the remaining shares. Okay, they'll maybe there'll be a February 23 proposal, whatever. But I think that what was interesting is that management, which you had one of the Coliseum uh, members on the board already, management basically rebuffed them. Management then went ahead and issued blank check preferred stock, which is permissible under the corporate charter Purple was a DSPAC. So they're issuing these P purple, or sorry, proportional representation preferred linked stock, purples, PRPLS, so that each 100 shares of common stock, you get um, one one hundredth of a purples, but that they carry 10,000 votes each. And because they have that cumulative voting, it effectively allows them to defend against this attempt by the 
plurality owner coliseum. So another kind of peculiar corporate defense. Um, I'm sure people are familiar with the DWAC, the Digital World Acquisition Corp, which was the Trump social media merger um, vehicle, where they needed a majority of shareholders to vote yes to extend the time on its deal to simply allow the entity to, to have more time based on the rules governing SPACs. But again, they ran out of author. Uh, they ran out of time, right? They 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 couldn't get shareholders to vote yes. So, like th these are all very peculiar challenges that are coming about by these circumstances where there's um, retail shareholder ownership in large numbers that that typically don't vote. So um, the last one before I kind of open it up to hear what people are think you know think about some of these and if there's any they'd add is Sologenics, a micro cap biotech listed on NASDAQ, who'd been trading below a dollar for a long time, which means NASDAQ then threatens it with delisting. And now a year later, they're still trading under a dollar. So they're in very real danger of delisting. And what it, what normally happens would be a reverse stock split. So you're trading at 70 cents, you know, do a one for 10 reverse stock split. So now instead of owning 10 shares uh, at 70 cents and $7 worth of ownership, you own one share at $7, which is still worth $7 worth of ownership. Uh, noise and the trading aside. So they needed shareholder approval for the split. They were worried about getting a majority of the retail penny stock shareholders to vote for anything. So they also issued another, again, using preferred stock clearly is the theme here. And we could talk about Bed Bath Beyond if we want to, right? Again, with preferred stock and warrants and you know, structuring things interestingly. Um, but they issued blank check preferred stock and each one had a million votes. So shareholders got one one thousandth of a preferred share for every common share they owned. So 1,000 votes for every share. Uh, the stock was literally issued briefly, though. If you didn't do anything with it, quote, all shares of Series D preferred stock that are not present in person or by proxy at the meeting of shareholders held to vote on the reverse stock split as of immediately prior to the opening of the polls will automatically be redeemed by the company. So basically, if you didn't vote, then you got issued these preferred units, then they went away. Um, and since that preferred stock was 99.9% .9 of the voting power of the company, and only the preferred shares that actually voted counted, then the vote passed. So it's, it's just very peculiar, right, that you're finding companies find these interesting, I don't know how truly innovative they are, some of them, perhaps, more than others, ways of um, getting around these real constraints that they are facing by their common stockholders being largely retail and largely non-voting. So I'll pause my whole little diatribe there. If you've read all of you know these before, then maybe you, you have something to add. If not, it's just a, very much a curiosity. And, and as retail remains a large mix, a larger mix than historically pre-COVID of the market, um, it, it will be interesting to see as, as these continue. So I'll pause there. Montes has... Please, please go ahead. And anyone who wants to come up and speak, this was the last prepared um, topic that I had for the newsletter. It's five fifteen. We can absolutely continue uh, through to you know top of the hour if we have enough uh, folks wanting to talk. So please, Monica, go ahead. Yeah. So I just want to make a. This is difficult for me to say, but I just want to you know make a blanket statement here. Investing in special sits is not for everybody. It is far more complicated than reading, you know, a company releases and saying, yeah, you know what, there's an ARB here I can do. And, you know, they have to make this 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 thing work. So I will go in and it's going to, you know, double, triple, quadruple my my my, my value in, in a short period of time. It, it it might work, but if it works, it's just sheer dumb luck. It's not. It, it, it it's 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 become so crazy that 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 you know people get these ideas from you know from discords and start investing in special sets, whereas people that I know that that have been doing only this for decades find it very difficult to suss out you know alpha from hundreds of these situations and find one where risk reward is lined up this is just you know this is not for retail investors honestly i cannot imagine in what circumstance they think that risk reward works for for these special sets 
it's just it's 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 a whole world unto itself where you know more legal combing through of every potential you know document that's been filed is necessary to not only just understand what's going on but to start looking deeper into why would they put something like that why would they have such a you know such a uh, proviso in in their filings in their statements i have to say it's beyond me to think why people rush after these whether it's amc or purple or any of these it's just beyond me yeah i mean so just to be clear what mont is talking about special situations investing um a little a little unrelated to kind of what i was getting at is more about these governance peculiarities but but he's 100% right that 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 is a very real approach to investing um, w- workouts, as Buffett might have said back in his day, you know that that's a thing that they've done. They'll continue to do. Um, Activision, Microsoft, right? It's a, an ongoing deal. There's a discount, and you have these smart actors who try to suss out is there alpha to be had because the market is pricing in X percent chance of the deal going through, and really it should be at Y percent chance. Think back, right? Of course, the most memorable one in short uh, in recent memory is the Twitter deal. Elon Musk agreed to buy the company for $54 and 20 cents. Um, he hemmed and hawed about it. He took it to Chancery Court. Uh, the Chancery Court correctly <laughs> said, Mr. Musk, you need to consummate this deal. He did at the agreed upon price. But along the way, of course, that stock traded down into the thirties. Many people made meaningful sums of money uh, buying the Twitter common stock at 30, whatever, or 40, whatever, um, under their view, based on their research and, and whatnot, that uh, specific performance would be a decision that the court likely would make to force Mr. Musk to consummate the deal. And, and there were there were talking heads saying, well, well, but he's Elon Musk, maybe he'll get away with it. And, you know, he didn't. But And so the 55? <laughs> what's that? And some of us at 55? Well, yeah, write the 55 calls <laughs> to fund some call <laughs> spreads, yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, obviously you can get very creative, um, you know, with, with special situations. But those are what I think Monet is referring to, right, where you have a merger arbitrage opportunity or, or there's something going on. And just to be clear, I'm, I'm more so talking about these peculiar governance situations where maybe there's a little overlap between the two sometimes. Uh- I, I know, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so don't, don't get me wrong. I, I was not, I was not, uh, you know, jumping on you for for bringing these. I'm just saying uh, that people try to relate these things to the wrong opportunity and think that there's something special out there that the rest of the right. market has not and, seen. And I think Bed Bath Beyond is a is a prime example of that right now, unfortunately, because you see in uh, their subreddit and in different discords, as you noted, and I'm in some of those, and I, I observe these conversations for. People have made up these stories in their mind about why this is you know, going to be squeeze, squoze. There's going to be a short squeeze for Bed Bath and Beyond. Well, really, what happened is a player came in and effectively took on the role of the market maker who will continue to sell equity. Uh, you know, Hudson Bay. It's reported, right? Came to this agreement with with the company, but but unfortunately, you, yeah, you have a lot of people that are not sophisticated market participants who are willing to read things written by other non-sophisticated market participants and, and trust it and invest their hard-earned capital in these things. And you know, I understand that there's a lot of skepticism around the professionals, but a lot of the times these people know what they're doing. The professionals do, in fact, know what they're doing. And it's, it's more uncommon to see things like Hertz, where a company files bankruptcy, uh, and then you see a return for equity. I think that is like left a bad blot on people's memories that and some of the meme mania where people think that's normal that's very uncommon and people should just like you said not be touching these things um other than maybe a few dollars of gambling money that they expect to go to zero um chris came up as a speaker i'm sure he has some thoughts he'd like to share i know he was a moderator of our bbby at one point he's a pretty rational guy sharp dude and uh, i know you've probably seen some of the the, the de- devolution of quality uh, in, in some of these discussions. People just, I don't know, man, what, what is it that attracts people to these things? Hey, what kind of a question then? So anyone in the channel could answer this. Because I've looked at the BNBY numbers and the financials. How the heck do they get out of their debt? 
and their their liabilities without going into bankruptcy. Because I don't freaking see it. Even with the, even with a billion dollars of cash, how much cash they get, I don't care. I don't see how they get out of this pickle without going into bankruptcy and do restructuring. Can anyone answer that to me? Because I can't see it. Chris, would you like to? Hey, um, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I'm driving right now, but um, I was listening to the call. Um, but yeah, I think that's a va- very valid point. Um, I think with regard to the comment on special situations, um, I think in, in the case of these, you know, um, corporate action sorts of things, situations, corporate governance, um, a lot of people, especially, you know, relatively uneducated investors and retail investors, unfortunately, they see special situations when they're there there really aren't or maybe the special situation is like a different one from the like thing that they think it is um if you go on you're breaking up a little can you hear me now a bit better yeah yeah a bit better oh yeah so you'll, you'll just hear a lot of like conspiracy theories about the stock, right? About, you know, this means that, right? And then when, when it really doesn't, um, these files. Right. And, and maybe you remote. could, maybe you could articulate with Bed Bath Beyond in particular, right? You have people thinking that RC Ventures, who exited the stock in full, is, is going to sweep in with Carl Icahn or something. Like, I don't know how closely you followed these things, but like, what is it that leads to these? In, incredible theories in your view that then people buy into and, and then like align their their being with and feel like you know they're being lied to by anyone who says it's untrue i think some of them really believe it uh, they were they want to believe they want the stock to go back up like it did before um others i think there's some sort of like malicious not like malicious Vicious, but not true. Broke up again. They know if they keep. Yeah, I'm, I'm out and about right now. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, keep going. Yes. Yeah. So they they know that if you know they keep repeating these things that are just totally untrue and batshit crazy, that you know a very large amount of people will see it. And they'll think that, you know, either believe it, A, believe it, or B, they, they believe that other people will come in and, um, and buy. I think you're right. What, I, I think, think the point you made, though, about there being a meaningful price move, if we want to call it a short squeeze for, for simplicity's sake, these tickers experience a short squeeze or gamma squeeze or meaningful price move at some point. And a lot of these folks like hone in on that. And they, they say, because it happened once, it must happen again. That's true for GameStop, AMC, Bed Bath. Um, and I think it gets back to often folks who have a limited experience in markets. Maybe they just joined after COVID, but the, thinking that that is normal, that that must thus repeat and unfortunately, you know, that's just not the case. I don't, I don't know. Is that, is that, do you think that's part of it, Chris? I think that's part of it. I mean, the thing with a lot of these low cap stocks, like, you know, you have all these pump and dumps, like you have BBI, BBIG, right? You have these, you know, very micro cap, small cap stocks that get pump and dumped. And like, this thing is actually really common in the market where you see a stock go up maybe 50% in a day or 100% in a day. And, um, but there's no really rhyme or reason to it. You know, there's, they just, just happens on some random day. And like, these people are basically trying to, um, be, to divine, right. A a rhyme or reason to why it happens on certain dates or, you know, with certain, this special company that they're like kind of dedicated their investment career to. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, I, I see a lot of discussion around failures to deliver and th- these views that there are um, massive hidden short interests in these securities. I don't, I don't know. You, you've been in you, – you are in Reddit far more than I am, and you obviously moderated that Reddit. Like you mentioned you think there are some nefarious actors that 
maybe lead people down these uh, rabbit holes incorrectly. I don't, I don't know. Is there anything you'd add? They'd... Um, that's just my hunch. Um, I don't know how. Um, I, I don't really have any like hard direct evidence of it, but it seems like with a lot of these companies that basically you have, um, you know, you have you know this idea that if enough people buy, right that'll go up and you just, just the, the goal is basically for these people is to just get as many people in um yeah no guys i got a question uh where do you guys see oil going to uh by the end of the year i don't have an informed view if anyone on the panel wants to chime in Yeah, maybe me. I mean, I'm not an oil expert at all. Yeah, but with uh, with the Chinese reopening um, and with demand side improving in China, that could be a, uh, that could be a catalyst uh, in order to uh, yeah, you know, you know that the oil price goes up. But uh, uh, but I'm sure that there are also many other factors that are against a rise in oil prices, right? But that's just one. Well, one yeah, reason why I, I, why it's I just wanted to make a point. I don't think anybody knows where the market is going from here. I mean, you had a hot CPI, you had a hot PPI. You know the Fed is going to raise rates higher and for longer. And the market, in my opinion, is not factoring this in yet. I mean, the bond market is acting completely different than the equity market. So I see a record number of, investor, of retail investors piling into the market. But, you know, the, the movement, I mean, yeah, you go by the momentum of the market, but I, I just think the, 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 the direction is wrong given what the Fed, you know, is going to do in terms of inflation. It seems like it's more stickier than what I think people realize it is. Uh, yeah, but when you look at history, uh, usually uh, the stock market bottoms before, um, before the last uh, hike, yeah? So usually uh, what happens is that... Uh, at the pen, I think it's called the pen ultimate rate hike. Yeah, that the stock market already can smell that there will be a pivot or the, or or that there will be a stop in hiking. But and um, and that's why the stock market actually is three to six months ahead. But I just uh, uh, when it comes, no, but I, I hear yeah? you. I hear the the market's forward thinking, and I totally agree with that. But what I don't agree in with is. Mile. The the, uh, the Fed is going to have to, r to raise either 0.25 three more times or they're going to raise 0.5 at their next meeting. And I, I think the market is only really factoring in 2.25 rate hikes. Uh, so I think that I think there's more that the Fed's going to do um, than what the market is showing. I, I would step back from the over over focus on the whether it's three quarter point hikes or two or whatever. I'll step back and say whether the terminal rate is five, five and a quarter, five and a half, whatever it is, we, none of us know. How impactful is that on your thinking or, you know, around your investment thesis? And is that quarter point delta going to really make a big difference over a multi-year duration if it's an investment thesis? Obviously, if we're talking about trying to do a short-term trade and you noted like what's the year on oil price going to be, that, that could be different. But you know, I, I would think we're going to get to a point as we get through the middle of this year where this hyper focus on federal reserve policy, hopefully shifts away and we're no longer so obsessed with every word out of Jerome Powell's mouth, because the reality is whether it's five and a quarter or five and a half and it's held there, that, that of course is the real question mark is how long will it be held there for the markets over the past couple of weeks begun to really reprice. I think that the fed is serious about what they're saying about keeping it there for longer then uh, you know, the market had thought there would be cuts by the end of the year. Um, just you know, go back into early January, and that, that's shifting away. So at the end of the day, how much of an impact should Fed policy have on a bottoms-up analysis of an individual security over a multi-year investment duration? Fairly minimal, right? So like when, we, when I think about you know, the, the tailwinds for semi-trucks and for defense spending and for you know, what we talked about Allison earlier, whether the Fed's at five or five and a quarter or five and a half by June, 
it's it's relatively immaterial in, in the long run. But I, I would totally agree that if you're trying to speculate, then sure, you know, you, you need to pick re- correctly. But that's where if you give yourself time, I think, you know, and it's it's more of an investment duration. You don't have to worry as much about that stuff. And I know it's more fun to talk about, right? But uh, just just my own perspective. Yeah. Uh, Rod, 100% agree with you. I think we've we've looked at external factors one after another for you know two two plus years now as moving the market, uh, as just the only things moving the market rather than you know normal fundamentals, earnings, and things like that. And I think there is going to come a time in the next few quarters here, maybe two three quarters, that will revert back to you know analyzing the fundamentals and technicals alone as the market moves, which is where you know we need to go back to. I would opine though, Matt, you know, to your question around where is oil going to be, it's still a fact that on a free cash flow to enterprise value basis, these energy companies are attractively valued relative to other sectors. Now, again, of course, it gets back to what is one's view on where oil goes from here. Um, you know, I heard, again, I'll inject Alice and I, I listened to their earnings call. They noted that in North America, they're not seeing uh, the off-highway business, which for them is hydraulic fracturing, you know, providing transmissions for oil field services for the rigs. They're not seeing incremental supply coming into the market. They're just seeing a sustainment of the existing rig capacity. So, you know, to your point, if, if China demand does rise meaningfully um, and you have supply relatively constrained, at least domestic supply, then all else equal, that would inform me that price likely moves moves up. But I think it's important to remember these oil companies are pretty profitable if you have WTI prices, you know, in the 70s, in the 80s, um, what did it close at today? Like 78, high 70s, somewhere like that. So prices don't even need to move. And I think that energy remains very attractive. Um, that's where I think as we watch the real economy over the balance of the year is because is, even when there's like a big recession in, oh, you know, in 09, right, there wasn't a meaningful drop off in demand for these energy products. So Unless we get some true shock like a COVID 2.0, I struggle to see why energy uh, is going to you know, take it on the chin uh, in the short term. But again, that's you know, just a speculation from me. Yeah, I think the at the at, at the bottom of the economy, the demand destruction was like one and a half, two percent, or something like that. So it was it was minor, I think. You're exactly right. Unless we have another COVID-like situation, I don't think the demand for energy is going to come down meaningfully enough to, you know, damage the prospects of the industry. And when you think about these companies, too, they've been beaten by the market for most of the last, you know, since 2014-15, right? They've been told by investors, we do not want you growing and investing all of this capex spend in uncertainty we want you to be dutiful allocators of capital to shareholder return in the form of dividends buybacks so you know in line with what i was saying about it doesn't seem like rigs are going to be expanding on net in the north american market i think these companies are beholden to their shareholders they're going to be more capital disciplined than they've been in preceding cycles so supply shouldn't see a big uptick, at least domestic supply. And I, I'm not, again, I'm not an expert in the market, so please don't take this as gospel. But um, you know, knowing that demand is unlikely to see a meaningful drop off, especially with the China reopening, knowing that supply is unlikely to meaningfully expand, it would tell me that price is unlikely to drop meaningfully, barring some big exogenous shock. Um, but, but Jiro, your hands up, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add something on what Monetive said. So, <clears throat> uh, because the uh, because the zero percent interest rate environment is over, right? So, so and that was the reason why ETFs performed well, so well, or one of the reasons. So, so I agree with him that stock picking will be very important going forward, because if interest rates are zero, of course, then everything goes up. But if it's two three percent, like in an in a normal year, let's say going forward, then it's a completely different story. Um, yeah, that, uh, that was it, I believe. Ah, no, another thing. Sorry. Uh, 
also on the bond market, yeah. So what I find interesting is that the equity market actually behaves much more rational at the moment because we have, uh, because we had already major drops in the equity market. Uh, what I'm very worried about is actually the bond market because when you look at credit spreads, right, that it doesn't make any sense to me that a triple B rated company is only paying uh, half a percent more than a government or something like this. Um, I think investment grade, sorry, I think investment grade, uh, this, uh, the spreads are around 100 basis points, so only a percent more than a government. That doesn't make any sense to me. So that credit spreads are still so tight, uh, shows me that there is much more downside actually in the bond market ahead. And that's also likely, uh, good point, Jiro, that's also likely where we have some potential event that could upend everything, right? So, so I think we have a messy credit market situation that could develop here. Yeah, I think in line with that, that thinking that it, spreads are very narrow. So the relative risk reward of corporates versus treasuries, why, again, why would I pick the corporate for that tiny incremental yield that has a lot more, I think, risk? Um, I mean, for me personally, I, I own, well, after today's OPEX, I'll, I'll have more than half my entire portfolio in you know a six-month treasury bill ETF, XHLF, which a you know, 3-bip charge, it's simpler for me than trying to buy treasuries. Um, you know, and, and rolling them singularly. So, yeah, I find a five-ish percent yield, right, annual yield for no risk. I mean, we, we have in the third quarter at some point a resolution of this debt ceiling uh, standoff, which who knows how that will go. But, yeah, the spreads are just too tight, I think. And something has to give, like you, you kind of implied um, will there be, you know, I'm not saying there's going to be some sort of a crash whatsoever. I'm just saying it, it feels like the market is very much pricing perfection. It's pricing in full, a soft landing or almost in full, a soft landing. And while yes, of course that may certainly happen. Um, it doesn't strike me that the risk reward is very attractive for incremental allocation you know, to, to corporates relative to, to treasuries and, um, for domestic large cap relative to, even treasuries. Um, but that's you know, where I think the point is you go and di you need to dig right at the company level and, and come up with company level theses for why this is a great investment, regardless of, you know, what the Fed does from a policy perspective in the short term. And uh, again, you know, an investment duration is, is multiple years. It, it really should be at least, you know, yeah, one for tax purposes, but I think it should be longer than that. I mean, you think in that sort of duration, I think all the you know short-term economic noise becomes a little less relevant. And, uh, but, you know, I know why we talk about it, and it's fun to talk about and speculate. I get it. I enjoy it myself. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but okay. Um, so thank you uh, for that question on oil. We, we obviously finished all the prepared content. It's 540 on a Friday, so... Uh, I think I'm going to wrap this up pretty shortly. If anyone else on the panel had any comments or any other topics they wanted to, to touch on, please do. Uh, if anyone's in the audience would like to come up and ask a question or uh, a comment, please do. Um, otherwise, we will wrap up in short order here. Hey, thanks for letting me come up, Rod. You guys have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, Monative. Appreciate you joining. Always appreciate hearing your take, sir. All right. Well, look, I want to start my three-day weekend. I'm not seeing any hands, so we're going to start the three-day weekend for those of us who work in financial services and, and get the bank holiday on Monday. Um, you know, thanks again, everybody, for joining our Wook and Review. Uh, just programming recap. We do these every Friday at the close. Today was our first time shifting the formatting a little bit. I think it went better. It was more conversational. It was a lot less of me lecturing, so I'm, I'm very happy about that. No one likes to hear my, uh, my ongoing monotone. But we will be back on Wednesday night. We do our little open mic discussions that Joe and I host. Uh, I host from my personal account, at Rod Alsman. I do those at 7 Eastern on Wednesday nights. Um, we do these on Fridays at the close. And as I mentioned, we'll be back on the last Tuesday of the month with our book club. 
Um, we do have some other programming that we're going to be introducing in the coming weeks. So a bull versus bear series. Uh, I had tweeted something out about the Tesla semi truck last night, and I think it would be a, a, an awesome topic. You know, it's hard to have, I think, productive conversations at times on Tesla because people are so emotionally wrapped up in the stock. But I think it would be great to have a conversation on the commercial vehicle side. You know, Elon opted to build a, a Class A tractor instead of what I think would have been a really reasonable foray into a step van, you know, a van that FedEx, UPS, Amazon obviously bought the hunt or had the order for 100,000 Rivians for a reason because final mile demand continues to grow and electrification is a great, uh, or final mile delivery is a great application for electrification. So and so it still doesn't make sense to me why Elon Musk didn't simply build a step van, which could have used a comparable battery pack to a Model Y, for example. Um, you know, the, the, not to go again too, too into that. But uh, we're going to have a bull versus bear series that we begin to kick off, whether it starts with Tesla. If anyone has any ideas for tickers, they'd like me to round up some of the best bulls and bears on and try to get these uh, spaces series going, please feel free to DM uh, at the at what capital handle or to reach out to me personally at Rod Allsman. Uh, I think this is, you know, it's always entertaining to hear the different perspectives. I try to do my best to, to manage these conversations and keep them um you know, f fair and balanced and, and respectful of one another. Sometimes people can, you know, I think I've said it before, people can be telephone tough guys when they come onto you know, the internet and on a, on a phone call and, you know, they're not in front of the person across the table. I, I do my best to keep these things professional and respectful. So um, that's another series that we're going to be coming up with. Also some investor interview series are, are another thing to expect from us as the year go by, goes by. So again, uh, what capital management, you know, we exist with this view that crowdsourcing investment research can realize alpha for all. If you haven't uh, checked us out, please do so, whoopcapital.com if you want to read our about us, and whoop.gg if you'd like to join our Discord server and be part of the conversation with us. So uh, with all that said, thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Uh, this has been our 20th Wook in Review, and hope everyone has a great weekend. So stay safe out there, and cheers, everybody.